My story today will completely baffle you, and I hope you will find the whole experience a truly awe-inspiring one. In this story, a newlywed takes a trip to a nearby town, while her husband attends a conference elsewhere. After that, nothing that takes place makes any sense whatsoever. One of the most striking examples of this, is what happened to Judy Smith. It has happened to Judy Bradford Smith, a 50-year-old home health nurse, who lived in Newton, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston. Judy had divorced twice in her life. Her first marriage ended quickly when her husband fled to Sweden to avoid the draft for the Vietnam War. Both of her marriages were short-lived, as she married a second time after having two children. A son named Craig, and a daughter named Amy. While caring for an elderly patient who had just been through surgery, Judy met the patient's son, a man named Jeffrey Smith. As both parties had experienced divorce before, they were not eager to rush into anything, and after 10 years of dating, the couple tied the knot in 1996. Within just five months after their marriage, the couple decided to take a trip to Philadelphia. Jeffrey was a lawyer. He was scheduled to be one of the speakers at the Northeast Pharmaceutical Conference, which would take place at the Doubletree Hotel, in Philadelphia on September 20. It was planned that the couple would travel to New Jersey later in the week, after the conference, to visit some of their friends. It will be Judy Smith's first time in the city, and she plans to visit some of the historical landmarks, as well as shopping. After they arrived at Boston's Logan Airport on April 9, 1997, the couple was boarding their 1.30 p.m. flight to Philadelphia. Upon realizing that she had forgotten her driver's license at home, Judy was upset to learn she would not be able to board the plane. After having apologized for her mistake, she told him she was returning home to retrieve the laptop and that she would fly out again later that evening. There is a possibility that Jeffrey will have to take the original flight, as he has to speak at the conference later in the day. Judy, according to Jeffrey, did arrive at the hotel that evening after taking the flight at 7.30 p.m. She had even brought flowers to apologize to him. It appears that they spent their evening in their room, enjoying the room service they had ordered. They were both looking forward to a busy day ahead of them the following day. The morning of April 10, 1997, would be rather typical for most people. After getting up early in the morning, Jeffrey Smith went downstairs for breakfast at the Doubletree Hotel before his wife. Judy was getting ready for the day, when he returned to their hotel room to recommend breakfast to his wife. Shortly after talking with her for a few minutes, he headed downstairs for the conference. On that night, Judy was scheduled to meet him back at the hotel around 5 p.m. This was to get ready for a cocktail party that would begin at 6 p.m. at the hotel. The last time he spoke to her was perhaps the last time he would ever talk to her. But he had no idea it would be the last time. The day was spent at the conference by Jeffrey. It is not clear whether Judy was able to do anything that day. Around 5 p.m. that night, Jeffrey returned to the hotel room, expecting to find his wife there waiting for him. Instead, she was nowhere to be found. In the meantime, Jeffrey would go to the cocktail party and continue to go up to the couple's hotel room thinking that his wife would arrive soon enough. Jeffrey would get more and more worried as time went by. At this time, he thought Judy might have been confused at the time they were supposed to meet up. He was experiencing panic, as he tried to figure out what was happening to his wife. The man knew Judy had planned on having a tour bus, drive her around the town that day. The tour bus would have taken him on the same route as a cab would. This would have allowed him to see if he would be able to catch a glimpse of his wife on the way. The night before, he drove to the police station to report her missing. As he describes it, the police were dismissive and told them it was too early to declare the disappearance. The next day, 
he told them he would probably be allowed to file the report if he came back later that evening. Jeffrey did look around the hotel room to see if he could find any clues that would lead him to find more information. Upon closer inspection, he noticed that the only outfit that seemed to be missing was Judy had worn the previous day. Judy's children believe, however, that their mother may have worn the same outfit twice since she was so accustomed to wearing it. There have been a few sightings of Judy around Philadelphia. She was seen acting disoriented during these sightings, but sometimes she was seen as a woman. It appears that there was a homeless, low-income woman in the Penn Landing area of the city whose appearance was very similar to Judy's. When Judy's son Craig happened to catch sight of the woman from across the street a few days later, he actually thought it was his mother. There are a lot of sightings reported by the public, so it's difficult to say how many of them actually pertain to Judy. To find his wife, Jeffrey tried everything he could think of. First, he contacted his wife's children to ask if he had heard from her. But they had not heard from her. In their conversation, he called his daughter to see if Judy had left a message on their answering machine. She rushed to the couple's house in search of the message. Unfortunately, it was not there. It is reported that both Ed Rendell, the mayor of Philadelphia, and Representative John Purcell, a member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, attended the conference. After hearing that Jeffrey Smith's wife had disappeared, they got the wheels in motion to begin the investigation. Jeffrey Smith reported that the police have taken a report, and they are very cooperative with their investigation. In the days following her disappearance, Judy's two children traveled to Philadelphia, and their mother was the subject of a thorough search. They would go to homeless shelters, morgues, hospitals, anywhere they could think of, anywhere they could find food. They even rented bicycles to travel around the city quickly and efficiently. Besides Judy's trademark red backpack, she carried it everywhere regardless of whether she took a purse with her or not. It was mentioned that Judy carried the red backpack on some of her possible sightings. In the early 80s, a man named David was convinced that he had seen Judy. He even claimed to have witnessed her sleeping next to him on a park bench. Judy used to be mistaken for the homeless woman he knew about, and he insisted that it wasn't her. On April 15, the family of Judy Smith came back to speak to David again. This time he told them he missed Judy so much that he just did not know what to say. The family searched frantically in the neighborhood for her, but they could not locate her. Jeff Smith was a believer in this sighting, for he said it was the last person who could identify Judy based on a photograph of her. On that day that Judy was supposed to travel on the flash bus, it did appear that she had taken that trip as well. At the Doubletree Hotel, a hotel employee said Judy asked the staff for directions. Around 3 p.m., he dropped her off near the hotel after picking her up at Front and South Streets. The family seems to believe that she was just using the restroom at the Greyhound bus terminal when she was seen leaving it. On the day after Judy was reported missing, the first sightings of her acting disoriented started. At that time, Judy had mysteriously appeared in New Jersey. Across the Delaware River from the mall in Deptford, NJ, Judy was sighted at the Macy's. Near her hotel, there is an NJ transit bus route that makes hourly trips from nearby to the town of Deptford. Judy ended up there for various reasons, but the biggest question is why she did it. There are reports that Judy was a bit off at the mall, but some of what she was heard to say was true. Her daughter rarely likes the clothes she selects for her, which she told her she was looking for her. Judy's daughter Amy agreed with this statement. In addition, Judy was said to have tried to get a young girl to leave with her. Perhaps Judy mistook the young girl for her daughter. According to witnesses who believe they saw her in New Jersey, Judy was carrying a red backpack. There were a few sightings of Judy around the Philadelphia area, but eventually, the sightings ceased. 
the husband and children of Judy did finally return home after some weeks of searching for their loved one in town. Jeffrey was still looking for his wife, and looked forward to seeing her soon. A pie was hired by him, and he had hundreds of posters made and distributed in the area. There was no doubt about the impact that his wife's disappearance had on him. After his wife's disappearance, he severely curtailed the amount of work he did in his law firm. In his view, the reason was that a significant portion of it was criminal defense work. And now that he feels like a victim, he could no longer represent criminal defendants in peace of conscience. The way in which law enforcement handled the case of his wife was also an issue for Jeffrey Smith. He was irate, when he found out that right after his wife had been reported missing, her name and description had been entered into the National Crime Information Center's database. Several weeks later, he found out that she wasn't listed initially, therefore any people discovered and entered into the database in April, would not be a match. The report also stated that Jeffrey Smith refused to submit to a polygraph test. Jeffrey Smith has categorically denied this. When we asked him about taking the test, he said he would take it as long as the FBI administered it. After he passed, the police department would formally request the FBI to investigate his wife's case. According to the police, Jeffrey, who is an attorney, was probably aware that the FBI would not intervene in the case. Therefore, in their opinion, his conditions were the same as a refusal. Jeffrey was never completely cleared as a suspect even though he was at the conference with dozens of people to verify this fact, when his wife became missing. It was also unclear when Judy ended up in Philadelphia. Police said the people who claimed to have seen her did not know Judy personally. Judy may not have been seen by anyone on the later flight. However, all the tickets bought for that flight were used, so it appears that she made it to Philadelphia that evening. On September 7, 1997, a father and son were hunting deer on a Mount Pisgah National Forest hillside in North Carolina. The remains of a human were discovered near the Stony Fork picnic area, which is about 30 miles south of Asheville, in North Carolina. The bones were scattered by animals. The blue blanket covering the remains of a skeleton, which was partially buried in the burial site, was found there. A police report was immediately filed during the police inventory of the scene. It was reported that some belongings appeared to have been partially buried, but nothing that would indicate the identity of the person. Police sought to find out who their victim was as soon as possible, as they were eager to break the story in the media. Upon reading the story about the unidentified person, Dr. Parker Davis, a physician at the Angel Medical Center in Franklin, recalled seeing a flyer about Judy Smith's disappearance. Jeffrey Smith forwarded the article to the Philadelphia Police Department. The department then requested Judy Smith's dental records from Jeffrey Smith. Judy Smith's dental records were given to the coroner shortly after. According to the coroner, the body was that of Judy Smith. In the aftermath of the discovery of the remains, there were so many questions. Judy had no identification, and her red backpack was not there but she still had her wedding ring on her finger. According to the family, she did not own the expensive Bole sunglasses found near the crime scene. Although she was dressed for hiking and wearing boots appropriate for hiking, her family did not recognize anything she was wearing. On the day that Judy was missing, it was thought that she had taken $200 with her. Of this amount, $167 was found at the site. Also, there were winter clothes inside a blue and black backpack found at the site. In addition, they stated that there appeared to be slash marks on her bra and her ribs. This led them to believe that their victim was stabbed and classified it as a homicide. There was no doubt about this statement. Immediately after Judy Smith had gone missing from Philadelphia, police started to investigate and there were reported sightings of her around Asheville, a few days after she had gone missing. 
Strangely enough, Judy has been spotted driving a gray sedan filled with boxes, and bags in two of the sightings. Her remains were found in a campground not too far from the last sighting. A woman asked if she could stay overnight in what appeared to be her car at the campground. The woman was then told she couldn't, leaving the area. One of the other sightings in the vehicle was at a nearby deli, where she was seen buying sandwiches and a toy truck for $30 worth of money. I believe that this is the most credible of the sightings. The sighting took place in a souvenir store near Asheville. As Joanne Stucker, one of the workers put it, Judy seemed pleasant, even saying her name was Judy. It was explained to her by the woman that she was from Boston, and that her husband was an attorney. He was attending a conference in Philadelphia, so she decided to go to the area of Asheville. Judy Smith's family was puzzled why she traveled 600 miles from Michigan to Asheville, North Carolina. Her remains were found with most of the money she had taken with her, and neither her credit cards nor her phone card had been used. Also, there was no sign of anything going on with her bank account either. As far as Judy's family was aware, she had not previously expressed an interest in visiting that area. Some years ago, she visited a weight loss clinic in North Carolina with her husband. The last time she was in the room was when she came to see him at the clinic. It has been reported that she also drove a patient to that area about 20 years ago, to see a member of their family, but the family's recollection is pretty vague about that. Honestly, there don't seem to be too many suspects in Judy's murder. Gary Michael Hilton is the one name that has been mentioned in connection with Judy's murder. He did indeed murder a couple of elderly people in that decade or so, after Judy Smith's murder. I believe it is true that the couple were hiking in Mount Pisgah National Forest at the time of the murder. The female victim's body was found not too far from the site where Judy's remains were found. When Hilton and the couple met, there were reports that he lived in his white Chevrolet Astro van, which was located in the area where the couple lived. It is true that Hilton Hilton had been known to be in that area for several years, after Judy's death. He was a murderer, but there has been no concrete evidence linking him to Judy's death. In the wake of Judy's discovery of her remains, it appears that her husband has been all, but acquitted as well. During her search, Judy was found deep in the forest on a hillside. Jeffrey Smith, who was morbidly obese, wouldn't have been able to hike to the spot or carry the deceased's remains there. This is because he wouldn't have been in a position to do either. As a matter of fact, police have come to the conclusion that Judy was killed near or on the site where her body was found. This is because even someone who is in excellent physical shape would not have been able to move the body that far in that terrain. Therefore, I would like to share my thoughts and theories about this case. I have really struggled with it. Unfortunately, there are no theories I can give you that make complete sense in this case. Everything about this case seems to be an explanation for why. As a first step, let me tell you what I don't believe happened. In my opinion, Judy was not there to meet anyone. If her husband had stayed at home while she was on a trip, she could have just stayed in Boston, and taken a trip to meet someone. However, her husband was away. Despite the fact that Judy told people some accurate information about herself, I am not convinced that she had memory loss. When I first heard about the sightings of Judy in the car full of boxes and bags near Asheville, I would have said it is not likely to be her, as it seems so strange as to how she would be able to drive. However, there was something that caused me to pause for a moment. It was believed that Judy left the hotel room the day she turned up missing with $200 on her person. The amount of money found on her was $167. At the local deli, I was informed that Judy had bought $30 worth of sandwiches in addition to a toy truck. The total amount Judy would have spent if she were the one making those purchases would have probably been $33. 
leaving her with approximately $167. Just some food for thought on that one. Although I don't think Judy left on her adventure willingly, I think she did so voluntarily. Although she seemed disoriented from time to time, there were no indications that she was afraid. It appeared that everything she did was in line with her desires. No signs were ever found of her being seen with anyone else. Because of that, I do believe that some kind of mental issue, or confusion was at work. Judy, who was such a caring and devoted spouse and mother, would be so uncharacteristic if she were to leave for an extended period of time. This is because she would not try to contact her family. The confusion may have led Judy to leave on a trip and lose track of time. This led to her being murdered before she could return home to Philadelphia to reunite with her husband. My question is whether she just forgot her driver's license by accident or if it was a sign of confusion, or forgetfulness. This was currently affecting her? Furthermore, I am curious to know if Judy was mugged, or if she received a blow to the head during her journey. She may have been confused, as a result of this and the fact that her signature red backpack and ID card were not found with her remains. When questioned about Judy's murder, her family said that she enjoyed hiking, based on what they had heard. It was also discovered that there was animal hair on Judy's clothing and that she perhaps visited nearby horse farms due to the fact that she had a great love for horses. She did seem to be enjoying the scenery and went on a hike willingly and may have come into contact with someone who killed her on the trail. The person who attempted to bury her remains appeared to have both a blanket and equipment to carry out the task. There is a possibility that they were camping nearby and already had all those things in their possession if they didn't bring all those things high up there on the trail after the fact. In this case, so many questions need to be answered. She did not meet Jeffrey at the hotel that night, why was that? What motivated her to travel to North Carolina? Why didn't she tell her husband she would be traveling? However, the story that she was able to purchase clothes and possibly a car is a bit difficult to believe. How did she get the money to buy them? Sadly, 23 years after the events of this incredibly strange tragedy occurred, we are unlikely to have any answers as to what exactly happened. A closure was never provided to Judy's family, which is often mentioned. Despite the fact that the family could have their mother's remains returned to them, the person who took Judy Smith's life has never been held accountable for the crime. This is because he is likely to be held liable. It was unfortunate that Jeffrey Smith passed away in 2005, still haunted by what happened during the last few days that his wife was alive. Judy's children had no idea they would be able to live like that every day of their lives. One day, I hope the family will learn something about their loved one's whereabouts and finally know if she was traveling or troubled.